Here in Matthew 10, we're going to look at verses 5 to 15 this morning. And we're going to look at, we, we looked in verses 1 through 4 at the, the Christ choosing the apostles. They were chosen by Christ. Just as each of us are for our service today, he chooses us uniquely and he gifts us uniquely for service. But as we look at this, we're going to look to this morning at they were commissioned by Christ. They were commissioned by Christ. That's the title of our message this morning. Look with me at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. It says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now this is, again, the, the commissioning of the disciples. We will look in, in the next passages. We'll see them being counseled by Christ, cautioned by him. And uh, he'll even share some other dire things that they are to expect. One man put it this way. If Christ was to be giving or promoting a job, seeking people to apply for that job, this would not have been the way to do it. But yet up front, he tells his disciples what to expect, and he gives them parameters that are difficult by any measure. And then he says, now follow me. Now we know he has is, he is narrowed down by choosing these 12. Notice there in verse uh, 5 at the beginning, it says, these 12 Jesus sent forth. He has narrowed it down from hundreds to 12 men. And, and we've already looked at those men, and we marvel at the fact that he chose those 12. And yet, now he's going to commission them. And commissioning is an interesting thing. Don and I were commissioned back in August of 1992. A commission is when you are sent forth. You are authorized and given a task and sent. And as missionaries, our sending church commissioned us for missionary service. They recognized the call of God upon our lives. We had been examined. We had raised support. And then we were commissioned to go out and serve in Brazil. Actually, it was not 92, it was 96, the commissioning service. We were accepted with the mission in 92. But as we, as we were commissioned, we, we were given a task by our local church, and the, the authority didn't come from us. It came from the local church that commissioned and sent us. You hear of commissioning today, you'll say a military officer received his commission. He, had, he received his rank, and then his commission is when he is assigned a task it can be a ship, it can be a department, it can be whatever it is. That's his commission. You'll also see groups called the Governor's Commission for Financial, whatever. Or it's, it's, it's a group that has been authorized and given an order by someone in authority saying, I'm empowering you and giving you the authority to do this task. So Jesus is now commissioning these 12. And if we study what the word commission means, I looked at Webster's Dictionary. It says it's an instruction, a command, or duty given to a person or a group of people. A group of people officially charged with a particular function. And then a third definition, to give an order for or authorize. So once chosen, Jesus now, remember he called them in as disciples, then he sent them out as apostles. Disciples are students. Apostles are sent ones. They are sent forth. And the context here, I want to be cautious. 
Because if you look at this, you're going to say, now, be careful that you don't misinterpret this passage. And we don't want to do that. The context here is a unique context prior to the rejection of the kingdom by Israel. It was a unique time in history, and the commissioning of these apostles is even going to be different than what Christ tells them later on, just before he is crucified. In fact, he's going to change some of the things that are given in this passage. So we cannot take all the things given here to these apostles and apply them in 2022 or to our lives. So the specifics of it apply to them in that task, in that day, at that time. It would not apply to them just a matter of months or years later. You say, well, why are we going to bother and go through it then? Because the principles apply to us today. The principles don't change. They will not change then. They will not change later when Christ alters even these instructions. So as we look at it, we look at it to understand what he told them then, and we take that same principle and examine how that applies to us in our context today. So as we look at this, we understand the context is relating to Christ announcing the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prior to Israel rejecting it, they will reject it, and then it will be postponed. It's now future even to us. But yet they had a task to do at that time, just as we have a task to do today. And while they have specific differences, the principles guiding both of us are basically the same. And we want to look at those principles that are cons consistent with my commission and your commission. You say, do I have a commission? Yes, you too are commissioned by Christ, and we will look at that. So our proposition this morning is fulfill your commission. Accomplish that which the Lord Jesus sent you to do. And that is everyone who calls the name of Jesus Christ as their Savior has a calling and a commission. And there, there are six things. Say, how do I fulfill that commission? Well, it's kind of outlined here and in other parts of Scripture. And we will look at those and try to apply those to our lives. It, it begins with our call. Obey your call. And you say, well, I thought only preachers and missionaries received a calling. No, no, the, the Bible speaks of a calling toward every believer, a call to salvation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes this, Paul called, an apostle, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all, that, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus, Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now here's a church that struggled with the, the point of separation, with being saints. They were involved with the world. The world had made its way into the church in ways that even unbelievers didn't behave. And yet Paul introduces it under the church of God, which is at court, to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. You see, we were called to Christ as Savior, and we are called to Christ to be separated, to serve. So we have a calling to be obeyed, not only in salvation, but also as a disciple. In Ephesians, turn with me for a moment to Ephesians 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4, this is the entire chapter basically deals with this. I'm, I'm going to give you just a brief outline of it. And then sometime this week, if you want to have an encouraging and challenging devotional, go through and study this entire chapter. In, light of, and in fact, it, it just spills straight over into chapter 5 and chapter 6 as well. So here in Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord... Of the Lord Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now he's writing to the Ephesian believers, a church. So this is not just to preachers and missionaries. He's talking about a vocation wherewith you are called. And then he starts talking about how that calling, and this, this will spill back over into what we're looking at with the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. He said, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, even as you're called 
in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then in verses 7 and 11, he talks about our spiritual gifts. He has given us, he says, but unto every one of us is given grace or a gift according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Look at verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. That's, that's, the, that's our spiritual gifts that he has given to us to use. Now, some of these apostles, it's not given anymore. This, again, was unique to the time in which the church was being established. Once the, the scriptures were complete, once all that was done, that those passed away. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us that. But now there are other gifts that remain and they're there. For, so what's the purpose of those gifts? What is the purpose of our calling and the exercise of our gifts? Look at verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We have a calling to build the church of Christ. I'm not saying build it so much in number, although that's involved. But we're to edify one another, we're to strengthen one another in the Lord, and as we do, we will grow in number. And then what's the goal? Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, that means complete, mature, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We don't measure ourselves by how spiritual our neighbor is, we don't measure ourselves by how spiritual our pastor is. We don't measure ourselves by, and you can put whatever spiritual person you consider out there, you measure yourself by the measure of Christ. The one who is perfect, the one that we seek to emulate. And then our, our outcome, look at verse, verses 14 and 16, it says, that we henceforth be no more children, to children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We're not going to be immature believers anymore. By doing these things and, and walking worthy of our vocation, we grow in the Lord, we edify and strengthen one another, and we, we become mature in Christ where we discern truth and error. And the evidence of this we see in verses 17 to the end of the chapter. In fact, it will go on in the chapters 5 and 6. The contrast between our former walk before we knew Christ and now our life in Christ. So you say, we have a calling. Yes, we have a calling to salvation. These 12 were chosen. Now, one of them, the Lord called him, but he didn't believe, did he? Judas Judas Iscariot, he, the one who betrayed the Lord, he even at the very end, Christ said, he, he, he's a, there's a devil among us. There's a lost one among us. And even as much as he heard the word and he saw the miracles and he had every opportunity, more so than most, he still persisted in his wickedness. But yet they were called, these 12 believed and they were commissioned Fourth, it's interesting that the call of God begins. If you want to serve the Lord, if you want to be commissioned to do something for the Lord, it always begins at salvation. Until I recognize that I am a sinner and my absolute inability to meet the standard of God, and I recognize that, and I accept also that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and believe that and place my trust in him, for my salvation, I can't even begin to serve the Lord. But the moment I do trust in Christ, understand that our call to salvation is synonymous with the call to service. It's like it's, it's automatic. If, if I'm going to be saved, then naturally I'm now going to become a child of God and a servant of God, a disciple. They're inseparable. Notice what Romans 8, 28 to 30 says. We usually quote verse 28. But we'll often ignore the parts that follow, and even the parts that precede. But for time, we're going to look at just these. Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. 
for whom he did foreknow. Now, to foreknow means he knew ahead of time. He knew of our salvation before it happened. When did God know about our salvation? Well, the Bible says it happened before the foundation of the world. So he knew that we would trust Christ. So it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So those who are going to receive Christ as Savior, they are predestined ahead of time. If they're going to trust Christ, then they're going to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now that should begin in this life as we begin to live and become like him. But ultimately it will happen when we are divested of this sinful body and we have a glorified body and we no longer struggle with the struggles we have now. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them also he called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, he, they, them also he glorified. He said, now how long does this process take for him to foreknow, predestinate, and call, and justify, and glorify, and how, does all, how long does all that take? It happens at the moment of salvation. You say, well, I don't feel glorified. I don't know. A lot of those things it's going to take until we get to heaven to be fully accomplished. But as far as we're concerned, they happened at that moment. We trusted Christ. That was sealed. That was done at that moment. And that's our calling. Now, these disciples, they were sent out. They had a calling to fulfill. God had called them to follow him. They trusted him. And they followed him. Well, first of all, we obey our calling. And that's the first step is you trust Christ. You can't begin to serve the Lord apart from trusting him as your Savior first. Secondly, you, obey, you observe your boundaries. Look at the latter part of verses 5 and 6. And I don't know about you, but when I read these sometimes, just at face value, without stopping and thinking about it, it, it jumps out at me and it seems like that, that's just not fair. Are you one of those that worries about fairness all the time for everybody? No, I can't, I can't buy a gift for this one unless I buy one of the same price for this one over here because that's fair. And, and if I buy one for this over here that's a little more, then I've got a supplement over here. Is that fairness? Well, some may measure it that way. But sometimes when we look at things, we, we, we'll say, man, is God being unfair? Now, how do you call a just and righteous God unfair? Well, you can't. So as we look at this, you'll probably feel some of the reactions I had as well. Look at verse 5, latter part. He says, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Don't you go. First of all, the boundary is where you are not to go. You 12, don't go to the Gentiles. Do not go to the city of the Samaritans. Who are the Gentiles? They're the, they're the lost. They're, they're all the other nations. They're considered pagans. They're not part of the chosen people of God. In fact, those who came to know the Lord, they would usually become a proselyte Jew so that they could identify with the faith of Israel and the God of Israel. But he says, when you go, don't go to the Gentiles. And don't go to the Samaritans. Those were the half-breeds. Remember back in, during one of the, the Assyrian captivity, when they took the people from that area over into Syria. And they sent others to populate that area from Syria that were loyal to the king of Syria. And they intermarried, and so you had Jews with Gentiles. They were considered by the Jews a half-breed, and they were despised. They weren't even allowed to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And they had adopted a lot of them. They had mixed the Jewish faith with the pagan faith of the Assyrians. So, so we will see as we go through the life of Christ, and we already have a couple times, where that animosity or that prejudice comes out against the Samaritans. Didn't Jesus come to save the lost? So why is he saying don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans? Is, aren't they included in that? Isn't this... To, to put it in the, in the woke conversation today, isn't this discrimination? Or in spiritual terms, isn't this respect of persons? The answer is no, it's not. 
It's the plan of God. Well, look at, the, at verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we see where to go. In his boundary it says, don't go to these cities and these areas. Now in the process, were there Gentiles that got saved? Yes. Were there Samaritans who got saved? Yes. We've already seen one, the Samaritan woman. But in terms of city and corporately, that was not their target of their commission. You go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why Israel? Because these are the chosen people of God. Jesus was the king of who? The Jews. He was the promised Messiah to the Jewish nation. When God promised Abraham, I will bless you. I will give you a seed, a land. And then he said, in you shall all the people of the earth be blessed. Now he's sending the Messiah who is to bring salvation and through him and through Israel and the kingdom established there, all the nations of the world would be blessed. But first what had to happen? Israel had to receive their king. The kingdom had to be established. And for that to happen, the gospel of the kingdom had to be preached. So when Jesus said there's an urgency here, which we'll see in a moment, do not go to the Gentiles. Do not go to the Samaritans. Right now we must reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because they must receive the king and they must establish, then he will establish his kingdom. Now we know already they're going to reject it. But at this point they were commissioned to go and announce the kingdom. You know as we serve the Lord today we, we can learn something from this. There's a limited scope that he gave to these apostles. He says, we have a priority, we have a purpose for now. This doesn't apply later on. In fact, when, when he gets to commissioning them at the end of the Gospels, he said, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to whom? Every creature. But for now, you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. One of the applications we can take for our commissioning, whatever gift God has given us, wherever God has placed us, and whatever task he has placed in our hands to do, we must learn to focus on the scope and the boundaries of that task. Many great opportunities will come up. They are real needs and they are valid ministries, but they are not part of the scope that God has assigned to us. Oh, observe the boundaries of where God has placed you. When one person that God has given certain gifts to accomplish one thing looks over at somebody else and says, well, I want their gift. I want to do what they're doing. Then not only does it create conflict over here, but then the place where God put us to accomplish what he wants us to do goes undone. So we must trust God's plan. It says, well, well Jesus, that's unfair. That's not right. In our world today, by our standards here in America, in the, in the common thinking, they would, have, they would have balked at this. They would have canceled Jesus. You can't do that. But he had a plan. And we must trust God's plan. There was a missionary one time that I read about. As God was calling him to the field, he had unsaved parents and unsafe loved ones. And they didn't understand God's call, and they resented the fact that they were leaving and taking the kids to a foreign field. This was before the days of, of all this easy communication internationally. And they were brokenhearted, feeling guilty about it, and, but yet were convicted. And their pastor said, you obey the Lord. And you go. And they did, but they prayed, and God sent someone... To their family. While they were over there winning the people God had chosen for them to win and doing what God sent them to do, God provided someone else here to reach their family for Christ. And imagine the joy in their hearts and the relief when they understood that, yes, God has a plan. He told Paul there in Acts chapter 16, don't you go to, you finish in Galatia, you're not going over to Bithynia, you're not going to Asia, though they are worthy and needy fields. I've got a job for you over in Macedonia. Later he brings Peter to work in those two areas. You see, God has a plan. We must trust his plan and focus, observe the boundaries where he has placed us. So obey your call, observe your boundaries. Thirdly, preach the message. 
Verse 7, as ye go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You say, well, I'm not called to preach. Well, understand what the word preach means. The word preach means to announce, to proclaim. So I'm not saying that, okay, we have to violate that principle that ladies are not supposed to be preachers in the church. And, and become pastors. That, that is a male assignment. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. But that is God's design. It's not that one is worthy more than the other. No. It's not necessarily better, that one is better than the other one. It's simply God's order. But as we preach, it, it, this is a general thing. All of us are to proclaim. All of us are to announce. All of us are to witness. And as we do, that's the same as preaching. Now look at verse, verse 7 as we look at, first of all, when do we preach? It says, as we go. You know, some people say, I'm studying to become a preacher. Well, have you preached? Oh, no, not yet. I, I'm still in first year of Bible school. I said, well, get started. You don't wait till you get there to do it. As you are going, yes, you have cities to preach in, but you may run across people along the way that are going, say, and you can talk, you can announce the kingdom to them. You can preach the gospel to them. As we are going, you teach and you preach. This last trip to Brazil, I was getting on the plane. I was, stand, I was in the, I was going to board along with those in the business class, though I was in economy. But there's a man beside me dressed in a suit and tie, and we, we struck up a conversation. There's something going on about th they were not conducting the boarding properly. But uh, we just, through our experience, we just were commenting about it. And then he asked us, what do you do? I says, well, I'm a, I'm a missionary. I train pastors in different parts of the world. And uh, oh, oh, and he just kind of, I was going to ask him, but he turned. And then he changes the subject. Well, he goes into business class. I go back towards the, my seat and the economy. And then as, as we're flying, I notice other groups. And I, wonder, I said, I wonder if those are Christians. Because they were dressed differently than the rest. They, they, they stood out. But there's no identification. When we arrive in Brazil... I noticed before they got off the plane, all those groups that I'd seen, they're separate areas of the plane, and the leader's up in business class. But they all put on their IDs. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this one, I think, is that president on it. Now, I don't know president of what, but he was a high-up leader. And he was taking others down to Brazil, I'm guessing, for missionary service. But as they got off the plane, they came into a group and they behaved differently. And I thought that was strange that when I identified, he wouldn't identify to me. Sometimes we think that, you know, our mission is when we arrive there. And how I behave and what I do in the process is indifferent as long as I do my mission when I get where I'm going. But I'm here to tell you, your mission is along the way as you go. When do you preach? It's 24-7. It's a life that we live. It's not a task that we do. How do you preach to me? Well, you preach. That's to proclaim, it's announce, make it known. Live Christ so that the world cannot help but see him in you. You know, we say don't draw attention to yourself, and you shouldn't. It's not a point that we are trying to draw men's attention for our own vanity, but we should draw attention unintentionally. Because we represent him and we stand out in a dark world. What are we to preach? Well, the message is very clear. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In that day, in that time, for those apostles, the Lord Jesus, the king of the Jews, was on the ground. He was coming through those cities and they were going ahead and preaching. You need to repent, just like John the Baptist did. Prepare the way. The king is here. The kingdom is here. He's going to announce the kingdom. You need to get ready. Repent and turn to him. We have a message, folks. The, king, the Savior has come. Salvation is available. It is freely given. And you can simply, by placing your faith and trust in him, repent of your sins, be forgiven of your sins, 
and become a child of God. That's the message. The message was imminent. It was urgent. It required a response. Sadly, Israel rejected it. The kingdom was not established. The plan is altered. But today in our time, the same message is urgent. It is imminent. Why? Because the coming of Christ could occur at any moment. And there are those who need to hear the gospel. As we said, it's not a task to be scheduled. Oh, I'll do this on Sundays. I'm at my service to the Lord, Sundays from 10 to 12, and Wednesdays from 6 to 7, and on special things. That's my service to the Lord right there. That's not the way it is. Our service to Christ, our calling, is a life to be lived, not a task to be scheduled. And it's as you go, while you're there, and as you're returning, you do what he has commissioned you to do. Fourthly, you remember your authority. Remember your authority. Look at verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. You know, we, we don't go out in our own name. We don't decide, well, I'm going to start a church. I'm going to start a religion. No. You are commissioned by one that God has given authority to do that. And until you have that authority behind you, you have no business doing it. So you need that authority. So what is the source of that authority? Look at verse 1. And when he, Jesus, had called unto him his twelve disciples, look at this, he gave them power. Not only the ability, but the authority against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. The source of their authority was not themselves and their own abilities. It was a God-given authority and God-given ability that they were to exercise. And folks, that is the same for us today. Even though we're not preaching that message that they were at that point in time, our commission for Christ has the same authority. He, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That happens at salvation now. And then you'll be witnesses to me in Jer Jerusalem. Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. We are to obey, but we must remember the source of our authority. Then look at the example. Who have we been reading about and studying about that has healed the sick and cleansed the lepers, raised the dead and cast out devils? Is that not the Lord Jesus Christ? And those who go out in his name at that time, they were given. He gave them that same power. Why? The church was not yet established. The kingdom was not yet established. And this was all new to them, and they had to establish the authority of their message. So it says, as you go, I'm going to empower you to do the same things I have done. And they will know that you come in my name. And these persisted all the way through for these apostles till the church was established. And at the end of the, by the end of the first century, they, were, they disappeared because the scriptures were complete. The church and the changed lives of believers was sufficient testimony. But he gave them that example. And then the extent. Do all those things that Jesus did. Now this is a problem for faith healers today, isn't it? They call them faith healers. I call them false healers. Because it's not faith healers. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus sent them out to do that, what did he say? You say, you do all these things. Now, we see people today, you watch these TV programs, and it's always in a nice auditorium and a place where they can collect an offering and take donations. But they'll heal the sick. And you'll see the blind, they'll say, well, I can see. The lame, they'll get up and walk, and all these different things happen. But you know what you don't see? They don't raise the dead. Have you ever seen them raise the dead? Jesus gave his apostles the power to raise the dead. I think it was uh, oh, J. Vernon McGee. He said he was talking to one of these prominent faith healers, so to speak, one day. And he said, why don't you go to the hospitals? That's where they need you. And if you ha truly have the power to heal, go through and heal those people. Because the Bible says they healed everyone that came to them. 
Not only those that if you have faith enough, if you pay enough. And that's the next part. He said the restriction, it says you have freely received, you freely give. You didn't pay, you didn't work, you didn't struggle, you didn't earn this right or ability to serve me in this way and to have this power. So you will freely give it to those just as I have given it to you. Now, what would happen to the faith healing movement today if they took that restriction and applied it to them? You freely give. You, you freely give it. There was that. I told you the couple that came to us in Brazil. Two ladies. They had, I believe, the dad and the family was dying, and they came to our our door just before Wednesday night service. And they, or I was at the church. Another pastor. They had been there too. And they had said. Would you pray for so-and-so? They gave me his name, his date of birth and different things about him. And I said, sure, we'll be glad to pray. We're starting the service now. Don't you want to come in? No, no, we've got to go to other churches and ask them to pray. They were desperate. But then the next thing they said, it just it kind of floored me. They said, and I said, well, we will definitely be praying. He said, well, how much does it cost? I said, we don't charge to pray for someone. I said, it is our privilege, it's our, our honor to pray for someone, but we don't charge for that. That was the restriction. And in our application today, remember the question of authority is there, and so we must remember our authority. Why did they do these things in their day? To authenticate their message. That's why he gave them sign gifts. Today you don't have sign gifts. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the completed work of God. You have the transformed lives of believers. That's all the miracle they need to see. The problem is they're not seeing transformed lives of believers lived out in front of them. We need to see such a transformation that the world looks and says, okay, that is different. Something happened there. I remember that lady at the restaurant in Brazil. She was a wicked, vile woman. I mean, she scared me. I mean, she did. She, all, the, all, the, all the waiters were men, big men. They carried these knives along as they cut the meat off and, and served the people. And she'd walk in, and they would just shrink as she yelled at them. We have sat there and watched it over and over. And then one day, I walk in, and I was greeting her on the way back. I went to pay the bill, and I was going out, and I said something to her, and she smiled. And Donna and I walked out and I said, something happened. She said, what do you mean? I said, she smiled. She has never smiled as, far as, I, as long as I've known her. But she was actually pleasant and she smiled. And we discovered later she came to know Jesus as her Savior. Then she started coming in and she'd line all those same waiters up and have them hold hands. And she'd have prayer with them before every, every Sunday serving, you know, for the meal. But there's a transformation that takes place. That is our authority. It comes in the one who gave us that authority. So remember your authority. They had powers that we don't have. We believe those ceased by the end of the first century, at least. Probably much earlier. But there's still an authority and there's still a transformation. A miracle that takes place in each one of us. And the world can see it if we will show it. Then fifthly, you trust his provision. Look at verses 9 and 10. Now, as a preacher of the gospel, these verses kind of make me cringe. It says provide, and the word provide there, it says don't go get. Don't go after. So provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. In other words, don't go to the ATM and get some cash out before you go out on this ministry. Don't worry about money. Don't don't go get money. If you've got some on you, fine, but don't go get any. And then he goes on and says, nor script. That, that's like a bag that you'd put your things in. We call it a suitcase or a carry-on or something like that. Don't get your bag. Don't get a change of clothes. It says, uh, nor, neither two coats, neither shoes, neither staves or a staff. For the workman is worthy of his meat. <coughs> you mean, you're here... You're going to send us out, literally, at the end of this, he sends them out. 
because that was the urgency and the imminence of what was taking place. You say, you don't have time to go after money. You don't have time to go after a change of clothes. You don't have time to go after another pair of shoes. If you've got it, take it. We see that over in Luke. But if you don't, don't go after it. You go, and as you go, you preach. And you say, you know, maybe preachers ought to be that way today. Now, don't go get money. Don't, don't, don't go after all these other provisions. Just go with what you got on you and serve. You live of the gospel that way. And now, before you get too excited about that, wait till we get to the next, to the next, uh, the next passage. And I say this because you say, does this apply to today? And I'm gonna say no. You say that's convenient, isn't it? No, but look at if you look at Luke 22, verses 35 and 36, the Lord Jesus changed this. He he referred back to this. He said this in verse 35, Luke 22, 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? Did you, did you lack anything, folks? And they said, Nothing. We didn't lack a thing. In verse 36, it says, Then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise a scrip, if you have a bag, take it. If you don't have a sword, you sell a garment and get a sword. So now that I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be taken from you, it says you will need to provide for yourselves financially, your basic needs, and even your protection. So you do those things that you need to do. Now, they kind of misunderstood things because Peter says, not Peter, but among them, they said, well, Lord, among the twelve, we had two swords. And he says, enough. It is enough. Now, some interpret that to me. There are four different interpretations, but it seems to indicate from the commentaries I've read that he's saying, okay, it's enough of this talk. You're not going to live by sword. Well, we have, to, we have to understand that we trust God for his provision. In this day and time, the urgency was you don't have time for that. You go and you announce the kingdom. In fact, later he's going to tell them, before you can get throughout all the cities of Israel, the kingdom will be presented. The king will announce himself. So they had an urgency about this, a priority about this. And in so doing, they trusted the Lord. Now today, we do have to provide. In fact, the Bible says that he does not provide for his own is worse than an infidel. So there are biblical principles that apply. So we don't, we don't understand this in that light. And I say to those who say, well, we think it ought to apply to today. Well, you may change your mind when we get to this next point. Look at the next two verses. It says in verse 11, And into whatever city or town that you enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. All right, you, you, you think the preacher should live off of Take nothing with them and just live off that. Well, the next thing was you live off of hospitality of others. You go in, you inquire who is worthy, and you stay with them. So if you believe that, we're going to put up a sign-up sheet in the back and say, who wants to take the preacher for the next month? Feed him and all that. You say, well, why did they do it this way? In the Middle East, you didn't go just go and stay in a hotel or an inn because there was problems of piracy, safety, prostitution, and all these other things. And it was, if you were from out of town, somebody that considered you, they say, no, you better not stay there. You stay with us. And there's a hospitality. When you come in, you become part of the family. And Jesus said, we are going to, you're going to trust in the Lord to provide that hospitality for you. But he said, you're not just going into any place. So the sixth point here in verses 11 to 15 is you guard your fellowship. You obey your call, you observe your boundaries, you preach the message, you remember your authority, you trust his provision, but you guard your fellowship. With whom should I stay? Well, verse 11 says, those who are worthy. What, what does it mean to be worthy? Well, in this case, it's talking about those who are receptive to your message and your mission. Those who, when they hear the preaching of the kingdom and the king is at hand, 
They want to know about that. They want to receive that. That is someone worthy, someone who shares in your faith. So it says you, you enter then and you stay there till you leave that city. Don't you be hopping around from house. To, oh, there's a richer man over here who has a bigger house and nicer facilities. I'm going to go stay over there with him now. I, thanks for yours, but that's better over there. No, he said, once you find that, you stay and you stick it out there wherever God has provided for you. So that's with whom to stay, those who are worthy. Where to stay, it says you abide there, you stay there. How long to stay till you leave the city? What's the impact of your stay? Verse 12 and 13 says, when you come into a house, salute it. That's what I was talking about in the last message over in Matthew 5. You walk into a house and in that culture and say, peace be unto you. It's just a common greeting to them, and uh, they'll usually re reply, and to you. When they greet on the street, they will usually kiss and say, Salam Aleichem in the Arab world. And I forget what the Aleichem or Salam or something like that, and, to, and into UP, something to that effect. But that's a, you salute that house. But if the house, and if the house be worthy, you let your peace come in upon it. Your presence there is going to bring some blessings from the Lord. You'll be bring peace upon that house. I, I've known people as you, as you travel around and you visit churches and you get to know people. There are some people that say, I don't want the preacher staying in our house. He'll be, he'll be judging all the stuff we do. He'll be preaching about what we do. Donna says she's going to kick me out if I don't stop using her, talking about her in my message. She didn't say that, but I just made that up. No, but there are those, but there are others who have, it seems like every guest speaker that comes through, they want them to stay at their house. Not because they're greedy, but they, they said they have an impact on our kids. They have an imp impact on our lives. God blesses us because of that privilege we have to be of service to them. And we have had the privilege to stay in many homes like that over the years. Well, what if the household is unworthy? Well, it says, if the household be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, in other words, they don't share your fellowship. They don't share your faith. They're not receptive to your gospel and to your mission. He says, let your peace return to you. He says, you're not going to be a blessing there. It says, and what, whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house, in other words, get out of that house, and it said, or the city too, whether it be the house alone or the city, he said, you shake off the dust of your feet. Now this was something they did when they go through Gentile territories or through Samaritan territories. When they got through that, at the edge of that area, they would stop and shake all the dust out of their clothes and off their feet. Why? We're not contaminating the Holy Land with those pagans and those wicked people, nor the dust from their territory. And so that was a symbol of rejection in that sense. And Jesus closes out with this warning to those who would reject. He said, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Again, things are different today. But there are some similarities as we go one thing is very clear, we need to guard our fellowship. Don't just stay with just anyone. Don't just, just be open, open fellowship with those that don't share your convictions, your faith. One, one person said this, he said, be careful hanging out with those who refuse to attend church with you. Oh, I've got good friends. Yeah, we're good friends. We do everything together. Would they go to church? Oh, no, they won't go to church with me then they don't fellowship with you. Either that or your faith is not a central, integral part of your life. And it doesn't mean that we don't love those around us and we don't express, but we don't have fellowship because light does not have fellowship with darkness. And one of those signs is if they, if they don't share your Lord, your faith, and are not willing to talk about those things, then folks, they are not with you. Be careful about being with them. I'm not saying reject. I'm saying you love them, you witness to them. But you put your fellowship with those that share the same faith. That's where you rest. That's where you are at peace. Well, how do we fulfill our commission? He chose them, verses 1 to 4. He commissioned them, verses 5 to 15. 
and you fulfill that commission they did and we do today, them under those parameters of announcing the kingdom, we under the parameters of the church and its commission before the whole world. You obey your calling, salvation first, then service. You obey your calling, observe your boundaries. Stay within the place and the task that God has given you. Trust him to fulfill the other tasks that need to be done, but aren't in your realm. Preach the message. Remember your authority. Trust his provision and guard your fellowship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, this example and or this glimpse into this very important time in the life of these apostles. Lord, while we cannot share in the specifics of that moment in time, especially with the rejection that came from the land of Israel, we can certainly appreciate the principles involved and, Lord, see how through the rest of the New Testament those same principles are taught us that we in the church age should observe as well. May we recognize that we have been called to salvation, called to be saints. If someone listening is not yet saved, they have not yet trusted Christ as their Savior, may they turn to him, knowing that's step number one. And then may we as believers recognize that our call to be saints is synonymous with the call to service, to be a disciple. And Lord, may we fulfill that commission faithfully. Apply your word to our hearts and have your will in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.